How can you get into heaven? What's the ticket? Is it your charming personality? Could it be your list of great accomplishments? Or maybe it's your character references. Well, you may think that these sound a little foolish, but you would be surprised at how many people believe these crazy ideas that people are just making up. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz. As we board the Bible bus together for another great study in God's Word. Now, in just a minute, the Bible bus departs for Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, where Dr. McGee will share with us what the Bible says about how to get to heaven. But before we do that, let's say a warm welcome to Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president. He's here with a good word for us on the Bible bus. Greg, where are we going to go today? Well, Steve, when you have a mission like ours to take the whole word to the whole world, you end up in some places that you may not normally think about. So that's where our prayer Bible bus is going to go, which is we want to look at our ministry in Dutch and Flemish in the countries of the Netherlands and Belgium. Mm. And I bet you haven't thought about Belgium for quite a while. In no, we haven't. Life. And that, that typically, in my mind, when I hear Belgium and much of Western Europe, yes. I think of spiritually dead. You do. You do. And uh, in fact, our producer of the Flemish, Patrick Couchement, shares this. Theoretically, Belgium is a Christian country. But Christianity is mostly just a tradition. Yeah. Very few people know the gospel or have a relationship with Jesus. Belgium is also very liberal. Most people think God's instructions are unloving or old-fashioned. People who go to church in Belgium are often considered strange. But through the Bible gives spiritually curious people the chance to hear God's word without having to go to church. The desire to be part of his church will follow automatically once they know the importance of the church as the bride of Christ. Our country really needs Jesus as their savior. Amen. And that is the only way that people are going to go back to church is if people are believers and have trusted Christ for their salvation. And isn't it ironic that we are getting better response out of parts of the world where people call themselves Muslims or they call yes. themselves Hindus or Buddhists? But boy, if they call themselves Christians, that is the hardest soil yeah. to, to sow, sow the seed of God in. Yeah. Here's another story from our Belgium production team. A woman came to the studio on a Wednesday night just before closing time. She was told she could listen to more programs like Through the Bible on the station. Three weeks later, she came back and said she wants to be converted. A week later, she was baptized. Our responses aren't frequent, but we are broadcasting to non-Christians. We never know who is going to listen. This is the power of radio and of the message of God. Very encouraging. Uh, and God always seems to give us that, that glimmer of hope. Even if we don't get lots of responses in these dark and hard places, it's wonderful just to see God at work uh, overcoming all of these uh, contextualized challenges in a country like Belgium or the Netherlands. Now, yeah, how about this next one from yeah, Sharona? Sharona, great. I am a young mother who has come to faith a few years ago, and now I want to learn more and more about it. I found out about you on the internet. Now I plan to spend every day listening. I am now in the Psalms. Such an encouragement. And then we got a Dutch uh, man who listens. It says, I find your Bible studies very valuable. I try to be there every weekday. I am now 71 years old and feel as though my mind is just awakening. Please accept this financial gift to keep you going. And Steve, as I prepared you know, reading these notes for us to talk to our listening family about this, I my mind went back. It was quite a few years ago when I met with Patrick Cushmont, the uh, Flemish speaker. And the truth is, uh, he was very discouraged. And I think it's important as we ask people to pray for the different people that lead through the Bible, that speak, that bring Dr. McGee's teaching, uh, particularly in these hard parts of the world, uh, would you pray for those who are willing to just keep putting the teaching out there? And in places like India and Bangladesh and even Pakistan, yeah. we're getting amazing responses, huge life transformation. And yet, these are just very precious moments when he gets a bit of encouragement. You know, I think that's a that's a helpful prayer point for those listening uh, to this particular program and that you could be praying for those that, you know, we are, we're always so excited about all the responses and all the fruit that we're seeing. And yes, there is much of that all over the world, but there are dry spots on yes. this planet in terms of response to the gospel. So you could be praying for our ministry partners in those parts of the world where they're being faithful to God's word, being faithful to get the teaching of Dr. McGee out 
and they don't necessarily get a whole flood of response. So pray for them. And if you are not already on the World Prayer Team, then I'll be praying for you. And hopefully <laughs> you will sign up today and you'll go to ttb.org forward slash pray and sign up for that daily email. It really will revolutionize the way you enter your email box in the morning. And it's just a quick prayer. You'll hear a quick story, testimony of how some part of the world is being impacted, typically with a very positive way. But if there are challenges, we're very transparent. We share those things as well. And we need your prayers. We need your prayers for the successes, and we need your prayers for the challenges. We know that none of this is going to happen without God moving in the lives of people, causing them to turn to Christ. So if you would be a part of that with us, we would sure appreciate that. Greg, would you pray for us as we begin our study? Sure. Father, we're grateful for the call that you've placed on this ministry to take your whole word to the whole world. And we want to be obedient and we want to take it to the places where we don't see a lot of response and we simply want to be faithful. So we pray for our producers and speakers around the world in those hard places that you will give them encouragement as you did the Old Testament prophets. And we pray that your word would bear fruit wherever it goes. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's open up to Ephesians 1 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we are treading on the mountaintops in the epistle to the Ephesians. Today, we come back to this first chapter, and we're not moving very fast. We're only to verse 5. We are in this first chapter where we see the church is the body of Christ. God the Father planned the church. God the Son paid for the church. God the Holy Spirit protects the church. Now we are way back yonder in eternity past when God planned the church. I wasn't back there to give him any suggestions or tell him how I wanted it done, but he's telling me how he did it. And I don't want to be unlovely, but I want to say this. He says to me, you either take it or leave it. This is the way I did it. Maybe you don't like it, but this is the way I did it, and... I'm the one that's running this universe, you see. God hasn't turned that over to any political party yet. Thank God for that. And he hasn't turned it over to any individual. And we can thank the Lord for that. He certainly hasn't turned it over to me. And I tell you, all of us can shout a hearty amen to that and thank him that he didn't do it that way. Now, last time, we mentioned that there are three things that he has done for us here in this matter of planning the church. First of all, we've seen that he chose us, and that was a pretty hard pill, I think, to take for all of us to swallow. I'm sure that we found that a little difficult. The Father chose us in Christ, and the Father predestinated us to the place of a sonship. We are going to see that today. And then the Father made us accepted in the Beloved. Those are the three things that he did in planning the church. Now, I left off last time in this matter of election where God chose us in Christ. And I think we ought to make this very clear also that men are not lost because they're not elected. They're lost because they're sinners. And that's the way they want it. And they've chosen it that way. Now, the free will of man is never violated because of the election of God. A lost man makes his own choice. And Augustine made that very clear, that if there wasn't free will to accept the grace of God, how could God save the world? And if there be not free will in man, how can the world by God be judged? Therefore, we find that God is the one that did the choosing. Now, I want to make a very strong statement today, and I'm back in Romans. You remember we referred to Romans 9. Paul says that there's no unrighteousness with God, and he says if you really think there is, then you better change your thinking because is there unrighteousness with God? And the answer is God forbid. And he said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Now, let me make this very clear, and this needs to be made today, because I get the impression in many of these evangelistic campaigns today 
that people are asked to come forward, and that even coming forward is doing something, you see. May I say to you that God says that he's not saving you because you came forward. He's not saving you because you're a nice little boy or a nice little girl. He's not saving you because of the fact that you've joined the church. He's not saving you because you have even an inclination to turn to him. God says it's because he extends mercy. And he had to say it even to Moses. You see, Moses could go to the Lord and say, look, I'm Moses. You remember me? I'm leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. I'm something on the stick. I'm really up there at the top. You'd have a little problem getting along without me, I can assure you. Therefore, I want you to hear my prayer. No, oh, Moses never prayed like that. You read his prayers. And God said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll compassion on whom I'll have compassion. What did he mean? He says, So then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, will you listen to me very carefully at this particular point? He says, Moses, I'm going to hear you prayer, and I'm going to answer it. Not because you're Moses, because it's not to him that will it, and it's not to him that run it, but it's God that showeth mercy. My friend, I'm going to be in heaven someday, and I'm not going to be there because Vernon McGee is a nice little boy. He's not. You just don't know me like I know myself. If you did, you'd tune your radio out. But wait a minute, don't tune it out. Because if I knew you like you know yourself, well, I wouldn't speak to you. <laughs> so let's stay together, will you? Because we're both in the same boat, by the way. We're all lost sinners. And the reason that I'm going to be in heaven is not because I became a preacher. It's not because I joined the church. It was not because I was, and talk about baptized, I have been immersed and I have been sprinkled. My wife she belonged to a Southern Baptist church, and she's always prided herself in being immersed. And I said, it's sure going to be funny if we get to heaven and find out that the Lord was really taking sprinkling after all, and that might leave you out, but I'm going to make it because I got both. Well, that's ridiculous. Why? Because, my friend, it's not those things at all that are going to put you in heaven. The reason I'm going to be in heaven is because of the mercy of God. I'm a lost sinner, and until you and I are willing to come to God as a nobody and then let him make us a somebody, you and I will never get saved. Your best resolutions must totally be waived. Your highest ambitions be crossed. You need never think you'll ever be saved. Now, first, you'll learn you're lost. You're lost, friend. That's your condition, and God is prepared to extend mercy to you. And you've got a free will. And don't tell me that you've got intellectual problems, hurdles to get over. You don't have any. The problem with you and the problem with me was not that we had trouble with Jonah or we had trouble with Noah and the ark. Our problem today is that the Bible condemns the sin in our lives. And that's the problem because of the fact when the heart is willing to turn to God, God will save you. Now, that is something that's, I know, rather strong, but maybe somebody today needs to say it like this. And he's done this in order that he might bring you and me into heaven someday. When we get there, we're going to find out he did it. Now we come to this next thing God did for us. And I have to go back in verse 4 and lift out that little expression, that phrase, in love. That doesn't belong really with the election. It belongs here with predestination. In love, having predestinated. Now, somebody's going to say, well, I never knew you could get predestination and love even in the same county, let alone in the same verse. But here they are. In love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of sons, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, this word predestinate is a word that's been frightful to a great many people. And predestination is a word that comes from proorisis, a Greek word, and it means to define, to mark out. 
set apart. It means to horizon. You go out, especially if you're in flat country, and look around. You see, you are in a certain area, and you can only see to the horizon. That's the word. You are horizoned. You are put in that area. Now, may I say that predestination is never used in reference to unsaved people. God never predestinated anybody to be lost. If you're lost, it's because you've rejected God's remedy. Here is the thing. Here's a man lying on a bed dying. The doctor has come in and prescribed to him and says, here's a medicine. If you take it, it'll heal you. The man looks at the doctor in amazement, says, I don't believe you. And he leaves that glass of medicine there by his desk. He could reach out and take it, and he won't take it. Now the man dies, and the doctor's report says he dies of a certain disease. That's accurate. But may I say to you, there was a remedy there, and he actually died because he didn't take the remedy, don't you think? May I say to you that today God has provided the remedy. Now, God has never predestinated anybody to be lost. That is something that you will have to determine yourself. That's where your free will comes in. Now, predestination has to do with the saved. And all it really means is that when God starts out with a hundred sheep, he's going to come through with a hundred sheep. That's all in the world it means. Again, if you go back to the epistle to the Romans, you find that wonderful verse that's quoted so often in verse 28 in the 8th chapter. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And as Dr. Tari used to say, that's a wonderful verse for a tired heart to fill it its head on. Is that verse there? And it is. To them that are called according to his purpose. Now, this that follows goes with it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, you see, we're talking now about saved people. He called, and whom he called, and he also justified. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. In other words, when God starts out with a hundred sheep, he'll come through with a hundred sheep. Now, that's a good percentage because I was told by one of the sheep growers, raisers out in San Angelo, Texas, years ago that, very frankly, he said that they would appreciate getting 65%. He said, we can make money if we get 65% of the sheep we start out with, if we can get them to market. Well, may I say to you, what would it hurt if one little old sheep got lost? Well, I'll tell you what the Lord Jesus said about that. He said a man had a hundred sheep. One little old sheep got out and got a loss. Most of us do that even after we get saved. Now, we don't lose our salvation, but we sure get out of fellowship with him. We get way out yonder. And some people think they actually lose their salvation. But the little old sheep is still a sheep, and he's way out yonder, and he's lost. And all we like sheep have gone astray. That's our propensity. That's our tendency. That's the direction we go. We don't go toward God. We go from him, and we get out yonder, away from him. And what does the shepherd do? Well, he went out to look for that little sheep. I'm confident that that man who raises sheep in San Angelo, Texas, I don't believe he'd go out on a cold, blustery, stormy night to get one little old sheep. I think he'd say, let him go. Thank God we got a shepherd that never says that. He said, I started out with a hundred sheep. I'm going to come through with a hundred sheep. And it's just as simple as this. He starts out with a hundred sheep. Now, the day comes when he's counting them in yonder in heaven, way out yonder, somewhere in the future. And he starts out one, two, three, four, five, 96, 97, 98, 99, 99, 99, 99. What in the world happened to Vernon McGee? Well, we just lost one, so I think we let it go at that. A lot of folk didn't think Vernon McGee is going to make it anyway. And thank God he won't do it that way. If I'm not there, my friend, when he counts them in, he's going to go look for me, and he's going to bring me in. That's what predestination means. I don't know about you. I love the word. He's guaranteed. That's his guarantee. He says, I've lost none of those that were given to me. And I love it that way. 
And if sheep are safe, it's not because they're smart little sheep, because they're stupid little fellas. If they're safe, it's because they got a wonderful shepherd. That's the glorious, wonderful thing about it. Now, that's the second thing that he does for us. But he's predestinated us to the adoption of sons. Now, I'm not going into that because I, I have dealt with that in Galatians. Adoption means he's brought us into the place of a full-grown son. And that means two very important things. It means, first of all, we've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, that the child of God has been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the new relationship. The Lord Jesus talked about to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, it means something else. Adoption does. It means a position and a privilege. It means that we have been saved and not only born into the family of God as a babe in Christ, but we've been given the position of an adult son. And it means now that we are in the position that we can understand the Father. Now, it's wonderful. I've got a heavenly Father today, and I've been a babe a long time. But, you know... He told me that he's put me in now a position where I can understand him. Today we can understand. And how? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And all of this has been through Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, a man, Christ Jesus. And all of this, friends, is for the glory of God. For now, he ends all of this each time by singing this glorious doxology, this wonderful psalm of praise. Verse 6, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, all of this is done on the basis of grace. And I'm going to talk about grace when we get to the second chapter. But it's on the basis of grace, and the end is the glory of God. Inception is grace. Conception is adoption. Reception is for his glory. And the beloved refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me, from the foundation of the world. God sees the believer in Christ, and he accepts the believer just as he receives his own son. That's wonderful. That's the only basis I'll be able to be in heaven. I can't stand there on the merit of Vernon McGee. I can only accept it in the beloved. And again, the Lord Jesus said in John 17, 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. God loves the believer just as he loves Christ, because the believer is in Christ. How wonderful. This is the threefold work performed here by the Father God. The Father chose us in Christ. The Father predestinated us to the place of sonship. The Father has made us accepted in the Beloved. And all of this is to the praise of the glory of His grace. He's the one that gets the credit. He's the one that did it all. And, you know, that's going to be for your good and my good. I don't know about you today. I'm going to revel in this. I'm going to rejoice in this. And, my friend, I'm going to... Talk about this, because it's worth talking about, and it's lots more valuable than a lot of the chit-chat that I hear today that goes under the name of religion. Oh, my friend, how we need to see the grace of God as it's revealed in Christ. Until next time when we're going to look at the Son paid for the church. May God bless you. We went pretty deep today, didn't we? 
So if you'd like to go back yourself and maybe spend some more time in these important passages, this study and all of our study in Ephesians is available for you anytime at ttb.org, totally free of charge, and you can always download our app and listen as well. And if you'd like to help keep the Bible bus traveling on in your neck of the woods, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE to do that. Our study in the magnificent book of Ephesians continues next time. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll save a seat on the Bible bus just for you. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?